welcome everybody. I'm um, just absolutely delighted that so many people could uh, join us this evening uh, for what I think is a very important uh, uh, Zoom conference webinar uh, about the future of regional journalism and regional country town papers. My name is Tim Ayres. I'm a uh, Labor Senator from New South Wales. Uh, the first thing I want to do is acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on. And of course, I'm coming to you from Sydney, from Gadigal land in the uh, Eora Nation. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging all over the country um, and in whatever uh, little country town or whichever part of the country uh, that you're coming from. So welcome. I'm really delighted that we've had such a... Um, such a significant turnout. This issue uh, for me is one of the most important uh, consequences of not just the COVID-19 crisis, but a crisis in regional journalism and regional newspapers all over Australia. More than 200, more than 200 uh, regional newsrooms and regional papers have closed since the beginning of the year. And I'm just uh, absolutely delighted to support and committed to supporting the campaign that's been run by the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance to back in regional journalism to support uh, the voices of, um, of people in across regional Australia and country Australia and make sure that those voices are heard. So I want to um, start um, after thanking uh, all of you very much for coming on just with a few of the protocols and uh, and courtesies that will make uh, tonight run really well. Um, the first is that you should make sure that uh, that you're on mute. Turn your screen to gallery mode. Uh, it should be on the top right hand corner uh, or on the top left hand corner, depending on the device that you're coming from. Uh, that, that means you'll be able to see everybody who's on the chat and you'll be able to uh, interact with people much more flexibly. Secondly, open the chat, which should be at the bottom of the screen, um, uh, or actually for me on the top right, dep again, depending on your, uh, your device. That means you'll be able to ask questions, to contribute comments, and to be part of the discussion. And I really urge uh, people who've come on uh, to use the chat and to engage with that uh, there. If you're having any technical issues, Ariane's online. You can send her a, uh, you can send her a message. Uh, and finally, um, we're going to video this and put it online later. So if you're on screen, um, make sure you keep it nice because, uh, because you, might be, uh, you might be on video um, later on. So the first thing I want to do is welcome the panel. Um, the, the first uh, person I want to welcome is Paul Murphy, who's the CEO of the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. G'day, Paul. Thanks for coming on. The, the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance have... Um, a big section of the union that is the old Australian Journalists Association. So they represent journalists and people right across um, the media industry all over Australia, and they've got very significant membership um, in, in regional news. Uh, the second person I want to welcome is Daria Turley, who is the Mayor of Broken Hill uh, and a, a fantastic community leader uh, and a long-time uh, leader, not just in Broken Hill, but in local government across Australia. And finally, I'm really delighted that Michelle Rowland, who's the Shadow Minister for Communications uh, in the Federal Parliament, is here to join uh, with us and, um, and have a yarn tonight as well about this really important issue. Um, I'd like to start really by asking, um, asking Daria to spend a bit of time talking us through what's happened in Broken Hill, uh, what's happened with the local paper there, The Barrier Daily Truth, and then we might open it up for a bit of a broader discussion straight after that. Well, thank you, Tim. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this important discussion. And while I'm here, can I also acknowledge that uh, one of my comrades from Broken Hill, Marion Brown's also online. I can see her there. Um, can I tell everybody that the Barry and Daily Truth is a paper that it's probably one of the oldest papers in New South Wales. It's actually owned by the BIC, the Barry Industrial Council, um, and it has the independent editor as long as things were about the union movement to a point. And um, so what we've seen since Facebook emerged that 
uh, mainly Facebook, you know, online presence and that, was that there was a decrease in media and advertising. So we already knew that the paper was struggling and that as that was evolving over the years, it was a thinner paper. You know, for you, everybody knows this if you're a rural person, the paper was getting thinner. But a paper is the blood of the community, it's the life of the community. So while we were watching this emerge, uh, and we've seen this year with coronavirus, all of a sudden every bit of advertising stopped and the paper ceased. It was a shock. As a council mayor, I got a call from the general man, the acting general manager. Um, I offered to him any resources we could in terms of our CFO helping or our general manager. But there was a bright spark that actually, when I say bright spark, there was a bright moment um, that happened and it was about rural communities working together. And what emerged was a fellow rang me and uh, he was a local boy that had gone away. He had worked internationally and he said, Daria, we can't not have a paper. We cannot have our community not knowing what's going on. We can't have a community not understanding what's past. But I know that, you know, it's probably tough. He said, tell me what you know. So we shared information. Um, he talked to the paper and he was able to get out of there because he's a businessman, how much it costs to print. And then he said, I will promise you 12 weeks of advertising to open up and print for 12 weeks till we get over the coronavirus impact. The issues are going to be far greater than that. And I told him this, but it was his determination, his ability to see the importance of what a local paper does, even though he has no family here, he has this lovely lady, he calls his second mum, and he said, how does she know, if you know this, or, you know, we're Labour comrades, how does she know who's died during the week? How is she going to do her jigsaw puzzle? How does she know what's going to go on? And so his determination to get this going was really about the fact that he knew the importance of what a paper brings, how it connects people. And it's not just Broken Hill itself, but around our community is far wider. So our online presence is probably greater um, in some ways, but it's the advertising locally don't see value in that. So he said about, um, and I'll do this very quickly, he said around very quickly knocking on everybody's doors, starting in Parliament, Tim, and saying, you can have this, uh, you can do advertising here. This is what we're planning. It's a very clear business plan. This is how we're selling it. And then he said to everyone, remind people of their corporate responsibility, the importance for rural papers to keep alive and how they need to invest. So that's the plan at the moment. I can tell you um, that you'd be surprised to know that Rio Tinto and BHP have actually paid adverts in our paper, which we're shocked about. Um, and nobody in Broken Hill has been upset at all because the, they still have a bad taste about BHP, even though they left us in the 30s. Um, yeah. So yeah, so it is important that keeps us connected, uh, community leadership, what's, what will follow, and how do you keep a local paper local, and how do you keep a local paper going without government subsidy is my biggest concern in the future. Thanks, Tim. Hey, Daria, thank you. I, um, it's an extraordinary story of a fight back in Broken Hill to protect that paper. And it's, it's, it would be wonderful if it was still a daily, but to have the Barrier Daily Truth still printing at all is, is fantastic news for that community. Um, there's, there's people on the chat who, the, 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 it's clear that there's an extraordinary amount of interest from all over the country. One of the stories I noticed there was somebody from Gympie who's, who's just said that their paper, the, um, the Gimpy, I've got to get this right, the uh, Gimpy, now I've lost it now, the Gimpy Times has been printing continuously since 1867, but will stop printing uh, in June of this year. I wonder if some of the other panellists would be able to reflect on what their local papers, you know, what their first interaction with local news was and what their local papers meant for them. Uh, Paul Murphy, are you able to jump in? Uh, well, 
my local paper when I was growing up was the St George and Sutherland Shire Leader, um, where uh, I had my first um, uh, thing published, which was a furious letter to the editor attacking the um, the then Liberal government over some issue I, I can't seem to recall. Um, it was it was published uh, twice a week. Um, everyone in in the district um, read it. Um, Absolutely, religiously. Um, it's uh, it's it's now. I think <clears throat> I think it may still be in print once a week, um, but obviously it's 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 one of the the titles that's severely challenged. And uh, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I think I'll get the chance a, a little bit later on to yeah. to talk a little bit more about exactly what it means um, to lose a paper. Obviously, for us as a union. Um, we're always concerned about the loss of loss of employment for our members and the deterioration in conditions that we've seen over the years. Uh, but we're focusing much more tonight and in the campaign that we've launched on on the impact on on communities, uh, which which is absolutely critical. And those those issues about the employment and workers engaged in the industry are really important. There's of course journalists and people who operate across um, all of the occupations in the media part of it. But of course, there are skilled trades printers in every country town newspaper attached Absolutely. to those papers um, have made an um, enormous contribution to their towns. And I think I can see from the chat, I can see some of those people have been coming on, some old printers who, uh, who I knew many decades ago. It's great to see you there. Good to see you, Gordon Cahoon, I have to say. Um, Michelle Rowland, are you there? Are you, are you able to talk about your first experience with local news? Yeah, sure, Tim. Uh, growing up in uh, and now representing Blacktown, our local papers were the Blacktown Advocate, the Blacktown Sun, the Blacktown City Star. Um, in the last uh, couple of years, we lost the Fairfax Community Papers and recently we also lost the News Court Papers. We now have no local papers in outer western uh, Sydney. Uh, this is an area of Sydney that has no separate media market, so we don't have uh, our own um, television or uh, other than community radio. Um, we have no uh, separate uh, media market to be able to um, get into people's um, uh, homes. Uh, it is really felt, especially by older people in our community. Uh, and also, I know that yeah, a lot of people may say, you know, technology needs to change with the times and a lot of uh, news is moving to be more neighbourhood centric. So different Facebook groups and different WhatsApp groups for neighbourhood. That is not journalism. Uh, and I think that's one thing that needs to be borne in mind that um, we really now, uh, it's not just a risk, it's actually happening that whole regions are becoming news deserts. Uh, yeah. And the concept of communities uh, not having local news voices is something that Australia has never actually experienced before. So um, whilst all these uh, tumultuous, uh, all these tumultuous events are going on around us, we are actually entering a new and I think um, terrifying phase. Uh, and it's one that's even more terrifying because we don't see the plan. Uh, we don't know what plan it is um, to get us through this being hit by uh, the impacts of uh, COVID, um, but also Australian media has been left utterly exposed um, by the lack of a plan uh, to date and really um, no idea of a plan in future. So it is, um, it is devastating, I know, for regions. It's also devastating for outer metropolitan, um, many outer metropolitan parts of uh, Sydney and, uh, and capital cities as well. Michelle, I think that's really important. I'm going to ask Maggie from Kyogle to jump on uh, in a moment. But, you know, in, uh, I, I might talk about this later, but the little country town that I grew up in, the Glenninus Examiner, was crucial for that sense of town identity for all sorts of reasons bringing the town together. But now with local papers disappearing across Sydney suburbs, they are so important to, you know, there are different community identities in parts of Sydney and the... Uh, local papers in Blacktown or Parramatta uh, or Liverpool brought people together in a way that now uh, they've been pulled apart and just given the one, you know, really part of the one big media market. It does pull those 
does pull those uh, small suburban communities apart or smaller. Hey, Maggie from uh, Kyogre, are you there? Yes, I'm here. G'day. Can you hear me? We How can all you? hear you really Look, clearly. I've got, I've got our paper. We're losing our paper. This is the Express Examiner, and this is its 150th year. And um, we're losing our paper in three weeks' time forever after 150 years of um, constant publication weekly um, to inform our community, which covers the Kyogle and Richmond Valley areas uh, from the border um, with Queensland, where I am in Kyogle, right down to Evans Head uh, at the coast. So it follows the whole length of the Richmond River, which is why it's called that paper. Yeah, we're losing that in three weeks time. And um, I can tell you it was an absolute shock to our community and we are uh, very upset. Um, if you look in our paper, um, there's pages of uh, people's uh, letters and comments about how much they're going to miss it. And in particular, I'd noted, as um, was said by Daria, um, you know, we have an ageing population, it's an elderly population, and uh, they don't necessarily subscribe to online news and so forth, and their paper is their lifeline. Um, it tells us about our cattle sales and what the what it's cattle country up here and what our what our cows sold for. Um, so how are we going to have that information in the future when uh, our only local news will be paywalled? We believe behind um, initially the Northern Star, which is the Lismore paper, is going to a paywalled website only content. But then we believe um, on, in a few short months that will actually become um, the rural section of the Daily Telegraph, the daily terror of all things. I could never, ever in my life uh, subscribe to the Daily Telegraph. So what are we going to do um, around to ensure that our communities uh, have news? I'm on council in Kyogle and I want a local journalism journalist to hold me and my council to account. Who's going to do that? Maggie, I can hear uh, how um, passionate you are about this issue. And, and I, know, I actually know the Kyogle Express Examiner. For a few years, I grew up in a little cattle farm at Terrace Creek. And, uh, and we did read about cattle prices in that paper. Um, it yeah. was important for people in the town of Kyogle, but for the surrounding little hamlets and, and farmers on those properties, it was the only way uh, for many of them for most of the week until they went into town to do their shopping on Saturday morning that they would have any connection with the community in Kyogle and I know that's the that's the case uh, right across um, right across Australia. I wondered if um, I could get Alex, I hope I'm pronouncing this right Alex, Alex Ray Good from the Braidwood Bugle um, who should be on the line. Alex are you there? Um, hello, yes. G'day. Um, I hope you're in a position to tell us a little bit about um, about what's happening in Braidwood. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Look, um, look, I did work for ACM for 12 years and ran the paper there as just a one-person paper. Um, I left when uh, Transcend occurred across the group, uh, which I think I could not say that it could possibly work um, but with their really templated models. Um, and uh, and um, you know, look, I went off to do other things and then basically started the Braidwood Bugle on Facebook out of sheer frustration that uh, news just wasn't getting out in, in uh, town. And then for the last six weeks um, after the Braidwood Times closed down, um, oh, well, it's supposed to come back, but I don't think it will. Uh, I, um, I've started uh, a paper by email subscription. And uh, I have to say it's going really well. I've had lots and lots of support from the businesses of town. And um, yeah, I've, I've yeah, I'm looking forward to growing it and going back to print when I can. I've heard some great things about the Braidwood Bugle actually uh, already from people who I know uh, in the township there who um, who just see this as their as their sort of last best hope to get some uh, local news up there. Can I go to Paul Murphy um, for a moment? Uh, look, <coughs> that's a I mean that's a great story, and I think it's it's. Uh, it's, it's really the way forward. I mean, you know, what we're seeing here, um, we, we saw 106 
uh, I think the ACCC found 106 uh, regional papers had closed between 2008 and 2018. Since January this year, 213, more than double the number over the last 10 years in this year alone, mm. what are we in, June, 213 titles have either closed, uh, gone uh, out of print, uh, been closed possibly temporarily, but we don't know how many of those are going to come back. Uh, and really, uh, I mean, we can talk about this a bit later too, but, but we need uh, government to pay attention and to actually provide a system and a regulatory framework and a tax framework that encourages initiatives like are happening in Braidwood. Uh, because we need, uh, uh, you know, communities still need news. They need reliable news. They don't need innuendo and rumour on, on social media. Uh, so we, we really need uh, a, a system and a policy framework that's going to support more of those initiatives uh, for local communities to be able to put that together. Well, I want to go across to Michelle Rowland in a minute to talk about some of the solutions and some of the things that government can and should do. Um, but so many, of course, of the journalists who are the high profile journalists who we see now in, in our national newspapers and our, on our radio and our television got their start uh, in uh, regional newspapers. Uh, and we know that regional newspapers have uh, deep cultural importance. It's impossible to imagine an Australia with Henry Lawson or Banjo Patterson without thinking about the newspapers, the regional newspapers that they were uh, writers for um, in the old days when you could actually write poetry and get away with it in a local in a local newspaper. Um, I've got Paul Secfi there somewhere online who wanted to make a comment. I think about uh, the importance of of regional newspapers in local community development, and then I want to come back to Michelle to talk about some of the some of the answers and some of the ways the government should be you know really stepping up to deal with this. Hi, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Um, Ginnage from Gumbangaland. Um, I um, wanted to make the point that we've been talking in the Nambucca because we've got this opportunity to have um, this conversation around making our community resilient because we've got a little bit of money just at the moment about losing journalists from our community means our community doesn't work properly. So we've been looking at not just newspapers, but uh, as other people have said on the chat, uh, community radio and, um, and uh, community web presence and trying to build that at a local level so that we can provide employment for local journalists. We see it as like a crisis of a profession going out of our community, like GPs going out of your community. It's the same thing. We need journalists in our community to help our community work. It's part of what we would say is essential social infrastructure. Um, it's a way of looking at supporting local because, um, you know, don't, no disrespect to anyone in this call, but beyond local, the, the state and the national don't make a lot of sense sometimes, you know? So this is about government's understanding that they support us to do our self-determination. Thanks for the time. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I appreciate you, uh, you coming on online. Michelle, um, the media landscape is pretty complicated and the policy architecture, you know, doesn't make sense to a lot of people. It'd be really, I think, useful for this group if you could take some time to talk us through the things that government should be thinking about, the mm. role for the federal government, but also, of course, some of the people who've made contributions, Maggie and Paul, I think have been directing themselves towards, uh, you know, the role, for, um, the role for our councils and the importance of media for accountability for uh, for local government organisations. But um, can you spend some time to take us through those issues? Sure. Well, I think there's three things um, there, Tim, and they all point to the fact that there has actually been a lot of thought and a lot of inquiry around this and a lot of recommendations um, have already been made. Um, the first is uh, public interest journalism. Um, there was an inquiry that started uh, three years ago uh, and it concluded with um, a number of recommendations well over two years ago now um, because the reality is that there are uh, new and differing business models. We know that that is uh, a fact of digitisation 
um, that the way money moves has changed, the way the digital platforms have impacted on what we call traditional media, um, that impact can't be denied. Um, but what that report highlighted was that there were um, a number of opportunities to facilitate those business models, be it um, through tax offsets, um, uh, philanthropy and so forth. They, by and large, really haven't been taken up um, in any meaningful way at all um, by this government. So there has been a detailed study into that very issue. And, you know, we've had uh, uh, separate organisations um, like uh, Nielsen, uh, who have uh, looked at uh, different models and approaching that from, again, from a, a philanthropic standpoint. Um, but also there's the Public Interest News Initiative that's being um, spearheaded by um, Alan Fells, who used to head up um, the ACCC. And one of his suggestions is about um, uh, putting government advertising in independent papers. And again, even something as simple as that um, hasn't been taken up yet. And uh, I think just about everyone on the call will be aware of the digital platform um, inquiry that's been going on for some years uh, as well. And that's made some really specific recommendations on everything from, and uh, Paul Murphy alluded to this earlier, about harmonising, um, changing the media regulatory framework to make it um, more harmonised. Um, ensuring that there's a, a code of conduct in place um, to regulate the flow of money between the digital platforms and the media publishers, uh, even grants um, for local uh, journalism. Um, and, you know, the government's taken up some of these, but um, in some ways uh, it has come as too little too late. Uh, the public interest news gathering um, fund that uh, just for applications for which just closed recently, that money, um, it's estimated not to start flowing um, for several months now, by which time, you know, as we just heard, there's been over 200 outlets that have closed. How many more uh, will close in the meantime? So I'm very sorry to say that this is a case of a lot of uh, thinking and a lot of consultation having been done um, but very little uh, action actually being taken, which has left um, our regional media um, so exposed. Um, it's also quite an indictment that uh, we've had uh, the Nationals leader, uh, who himself was involved in um, at least one regional newspaper, uh, come out and say, you know, we need to look at um, a variety of options, uh, but, you know, it looks like he's, uh, yeah, he, his views aren't being uh, listened to or certainly uh, the communications minister uh, isn't responding to that in a fulsome way. Um, so it really is, um, it's quite a, tale of, quite a tale of woe. I mean, it was bad enough pre-COVID. And, and I think we need to be very clear uh, because some of the government announcements around, uh, around this are uh, that you know, this is some sort of a rescue package. This was, these circumstances were dire even pre-COVID. Um, and again, I think I'll, and I'll end on this point, Tim, um, with digital disruption not happening overnight, the government having had no plan, uh, and we're left in a position where, again, access to the internet and being able to go online for news is not an option um, in many communities. And with no uh, sustainable, uh, business models um, having been proposed as an alternative, um, we find ourselves in the position that we are today. So it's important for us, and I commend you for um, holding this, it's important for us to keep highlighting this to show that local voices and local news gathering remains important um, to the Australian people. And I'm sure that if you asked anyone, um, you would get that response. Yeah, it's the starting point, isn't it? The government has to decide that this is a problem that government should do something about. And uh, certainly the reaction that, that I've got in the parliament from, uh, from people who are in government now, including, um, including the deputy prime minister, who was for a period when I was working in the Riverina was the editor of the, um, the, Wagga, uh, the Wagga Daily Advertiser, I think it was called. Um, it wasn't a great period for the Wagga Daily Advertiser, but he certainly was the editor and he should know how important those papers are. Uh, but it's about deciding that it's a problem that we've got to solve. It sounds like, from, from what you're saying, that there's a, 
immediate things that the government could do, government advertising, like it probably a pretty good time to step up and put some, uh, put some advertising in the local papers, particularly public health messages, um, serve a couple of purposes. But it does sound to me like a lot of work needs to go into, if we can reopen these papers, about providing a media landscape that they can operate in with a reasonable business model. Paul Murphy, did you want to jump in? Right now. Look, I, look. It's it's it. I mean, the the position we're in. Michelle's absolutely right. I mean, this. It's not like nobody could see this coming. It's it's been a, a train wreck that's been happening for quite a while, and there have been inquiries, including that uh, public interest journalism inquiry, which is one of my favourites because it was prompted by a very gutsy seven day long strike by our members at Fairfax um, during the the last big redundancy rounds there. But I think, I mean, you have to, when you look at um, successive governments over the past 20 or 30 years, when it comes to media policy, you know, all that's happened is tinkering with ownership rules. And that served the interests of proprietors. It served the interests of shareholders. It hasn't served the interests of communities. And really, public policy needs to be repositioned and government policy needs to be repositioned to have communities at the centre. It's, it's the, the needs of the communities that have to drive uh, the policy going forward. Uh, because, you know, we talk about news deserts, but I fear it's actually worse than that. And if, if you look at some research from overseas, it's not that there's no news uh, when the local paper disappears. It just gets replaced with um, uh, rumour, innuendo, it causes division amongst communities. It has a detrimental effect on our democracy. Uh, you know, government policy needs to have the community at the centre of it uh, and the needs of the community uh, need to drive every decision that's taken. Yeah, but thank you, Paul. I should, um, I should acknowledge now that there's a couple of, uh, of other members of parliament who are online. Brian Mitchell, who'd got his start uh, as a, his first job as a cadet journalist in one of the papers in Tasmania. Welcome, Brian. And Warren Snowden, the member for Lingiari in the Northern Territory. Welcome, Warren, as well. Um, I wanted to go quickly to um, to Andrew from Yes. Um, I know that there's uh, challenges uh, in, uh, in Yes and the Yes Courier's um, been under pressure. Mate, could you take us through what's happening in Yes for a couple of minutes? If you're still there, you've got to take yourself off mute too. In the absence of Andrew, it's probably a bit unfair to jump him on without, uh, without uh, talking to him first. I might, um, I might ask um, Joel Richters, who also wanted to make a contribution, I think, uh, coming through the chat. Andrew, we'll try and get you back on in a moment. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Gundawindi is a, a small country town on the, the New South Wales Queensland border, and we're uh, we're about to well we're probably going to lose the Gundawindi Argus um, completely. Warwick Daily and, and Stanfield Border Post have both gone to digital only copies. But like the other people that have spoken tonight, all of our community, uh, or, or ele over fifty percent of our community, are the elderly people um, who are not going to join uh, subscriptions and not going to be able to access papers digitally uh, and there is going to be a huge gap and, and like was just mentioned social media is not going to be a reliable replacement um, we see social media here becoming very volatile uh, and a toxic community um, that just is providing division amongst the community and um, so you know i think the, the there was a, a brief suggestion that maybe there's a role for councils to play in our local media and I think that's actually something that's got some merit to following up. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much that uh, Joel. I um, We were going to try to go to Andrew from Yes because it sounded like a really interesting story. We can't get your audio working mate so we, we will come back to you over the next couple of days because I'd like to talk to you directly about what's happening there. Um, Paul, Paul uh, there's Somebody waving to me, I can see you, but I can't, you're, you're down as Peter Davidson, but you're clearly not Peter. Can, no, can, Judith. There we go. Thanks, Judith. Yeah, 
Uh, I live in Yass and uh, I've been writing for the Yass Tribune for the uh, Yass District Historical Society. And um, I do want to make the point that local papers are really the historical record. And our Yass Tribune Courier has been going in Yass since the 1850s. And it's an absolutely invaluable record of the community and how it's grown and developed and changed and so forth and the issues that have concerned it. Um, I also, of course, find it really important that they are able to hold local government to account. Uh, and we, we lose that when we lose the paper. And of course, promoting community cohesiveness. In Yas at the moment, we're really on, the, on, the, on a cusp, I guess. And Andrew, uh, who I'm, I haven't contacted Andrew, uh, but he, I gather, is trying to get up the Yas Courier uh, the Yash Trib itself is teetering. It's digitised and online, stopped as a hard copy paper. Uh, and I know they're, they're really pushed. I don't know how long they're going to continue. There is another initiative in Yash at the moment called the Yash Valley Times, which has been started by one of the local councillors. Uh, she was a journalist. Um, I don't know how she's going to go. She's trying to, she'll be both a digital and a hard copy uh, paper, uh, essentially, I think, privately funded. Uh, it'll be a business opportunity there. Uh, but as you can see, it's a bit of a, a mixed bundle at YAS at the moment, and it'll be a while, I think, before it all shakes out. Thank you. Thanks very much, Judith. I, um, if there's anything that I or Paul um, or anybody on the panel can do to support um, your work, it sounds like there are a lot of people in YAS who want to make sure that there's uh, local journalism and a local paper. It'd be great if we could find a way of you all working together. Um, you're right, 100% right, about how important uh, local papers are for local history and as journals of record. Um, you know, I've, I have uh, you know, all those people who do all that family history work, you know, all that, you know, all those people who are thousands and thousands of Australians, it's not possible to do that work unless there's local papers that are that are the journals of record. I would say, if, you, if you're if you interested, uh, please don't look at the Glen Innes Examiner, sort of 1989 to 1992. Um, there's some photos of me in there that are pretty, um, pretty embarrassing. Um, you know, leaping over things or catching balls or doing whatever it was that I was doing. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not pretty, but thank you very much. And if there's anything we can do, absolutely love to contribute to supporting uh, your work. Uh, and the work of all those people in local communities who are fighting for regional journalism. Judith also talked about uh, local councils being held to account and some of the other contributors have talked about the role of, the potential role of local councillors working with uh, local journalists and local papers to, to hold the line and put something together. Daria, did you have anything to say about the role of local council, local council organisations, um, you know, to support this work? Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, look, can I just say that one of the things about local government uh, pre-COVID, for most rural communities, we're already struggling, but we tend to provide other means of connecting and supporting the paper. Certainly, you know, we give them untold journalism, you know, stories, but also we provide adverts in their paper as well. In any given year, we I shouldn't say how much we pay, but probably pay for a full-time position um, and uh, with our adverts that we place there. We're still, you know, we're not as big a town as we used to be, but we still have a significant population and our paper is not just, although it is for Broken Hill, it does service the whole region. So it is a struggle. Um, I think that local government will always pay for adverts in the paper but I don't think they can take them on except if you're in a very smaller community where it is a smaller paper if I, and I don't know how to describe that but I know if I went to Ivanhoe and I or if I went to Wakanya and I bought their local paper it's five pages um, you know it's a different type of uh, advertising it's more government advertising so it's a bit of a challenge all, all the way around the other thing I was going to say is that local papers, your local paper as a business never thought about what the potential they could do with their product. So all they thought, for me, one of the issues is that 
all they could see is printing a paper and keeping us all connected, which is my goal. But when we were looking at the struggles for our local paper, we realised that they have a printing press. They, they, there's other business that they could have mm. generated. Um, but for me, you know, it wasn't their priority because their priority was about keeping the community connected. And they have 30 staff they needed to keep employed. I, I don't want you to uh, undersell your own role there, though, Daria. Like, the, the truth is, the Barrier Daily Truth, uh, certainly the people who you've um, given credit for, for, for making the big effort to, to bring the paper back, um, have played an important role. But without your leadership in local government, putting those people together and encouraging them to take the steps and giving them the confidence to take the steps that they did, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't that wouldn't have happened. I do notice that we've got Bruce Allen from um, from Country uh, uh, from Country Press Australia, who's their president, on the line. Bruce, did you want to contribute anything at this stage um, at this stage of the debate? Look, thanks, Tim. Can you hear me? I can hear you really clearly, mate. Thank you. Okay. Look, thanks for organising the forum. I think it's been very informative. Uh, it's certainly something that I think has been alluded to that. It hasn't really crept on up, crept up um, quickly. It's been something that has emerging. Um, just for, so everyone's aware, Country Press Australia represents 140 regional and small publishers around Australia. It's interesting that uh, throughout this the COVID-19 crisis, um, all but I think a handful of members have continued to publish. Uh, as local proprietors and of people who have part of the community, we value our communities, uh, and despite the commercial realities that media across the world are facing, um, our members have continued to publish to service their communities. Uh, having said that, I don't think we should underestimate the, the cost and effort that's involved in producing a regular weekly newspaper. The community model is, is certainly a model. However, most of those community papers at the moment produce a monthly newspaper perhaps by volunteers for people to commit to a community based model and expect people to work as a volunteer five days a week is unrealistic. So it's a great model if it can work commercially though, I'm not quite sure whether it's viable, it's like to think that it would be. Um, so there's certainly um, uh, newspapers across um, Queensland, New South Wales, that uh, have been foreshadowed, uh, well, they've been closed certainly in Queensland, and there's a foreshadow of uh, other papers as well. And look, I think there's opportunity for, for government to give support um, in particular areas, and some of the funding that Michelle has uh, mentioned is hasn't been announced yet, but has been uh, certainly applied for. Um, we would take issue with how some of that funding has been, was likely to be allocated. Um, but yeah, look, there, there are, I know there are some publishers uh, who are looking at establishing or re-establishing newspapers uh, in Queensland in certain towns. Um, I'm certainly that if there are people that are, um, yeah, there, there are, that, that is happening that I'm aware of at the moment. Uh, one of the issues that we do face, uh, these publishers do face, is there seems to be a shortage of press time for anybody who is looking at printing newspapers. Um, so I think if there's an initiative to be taken in terms of helping to re-establish newspapers in particularly Queensland towns at the moment, because they're the ones that are definitely slated for closure, um, government funding of or support for a press facility in Queensland um, is vital um, to help support the re-establishment of newspapers in those communities. And I would point out also that we talk about newspapers, but um, the independent publishers, uh, and I guess our members are mainly in Victoria and South Australia, we aren't just newspapers anymore. We are news media businesses. Uh, we, all, we all run newspapers and that's the basis of our revenue. However, we also run um, very well engaged websites, social media platforms as well. Uh, so we, we are just, we are news media businesses and that's the way we need to look at going, going forward. 
Um, but certainly, we, we, uh, the, the print model is certainly a very important um, asset uh, to regional communities. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. It's really great to hear um, to hear your voice and to hear your perspective uh, on these issues. And um, I'd really encourage you, if you and uh, Paul haven't haven't met yet, I reckon it's a real really important that um, that you're engaged with uh, with the union on these issues. And maybe Paul, I, I wanted to come to you to talk about some of the policy solutions, but also the campaign that the union uh, has been running uh, and is leading uh, on this issue. Uh, but maybe um, if you could reflect a little bit on on uh, Bruce's comments and the, you know those those big cost and business model issues that are putting pressure on um, on many of these local papers. Sure. Um, look, yeah. I mean, our, our campaign, which only just recently launched, obviously is off the back of the um, the, the recent events. I mean, the, the crisis really coming to a head during this this COVID period. Uh, and I'd encourage everyone who's who's on this Zoom, and I really appreciate all all of the passion and the the stories that are being shared um, to to sign up uh, to our campaign. You can do that uh, through uh, our website www.meaa.org forward slash our stories matter uh, to make sure that you get our campaign material uh, as we as we develop different aspects of it um, and I'd encourage everyone to, to participate in it. Um, I mean, you know, it's certainly the case uh, that there's a crisis in the business model of journalism. I don't believe there's a crisis in journalism uh, and I don't believe there's any lessening in demand for journalism. In fact, when you look at the figures, particularly during this pandemic period, people have been um, turning on in record numbers uh, to, to um, trusted news sources. Uh, yeah, the issue is uh, how, how, how we sustain that going forward. It's an issue for government. As Michelle said, there's been plenty of research here and overseas. There's been plenty of recommendations, uh, even from no lesser body than the ACCC. Uh, it's, it, it took enormous prodding to get the government to the point of putting together that $50 million fund for regional and local journalism, um, which is still quite some time uh, away from flowing. But that doesn't meet the recommendation that the ACCC made last year. The ACCC recognised the crisis in regional and local journalism, and it said the government should establish a $50 million fund per annum every year, ongoing, uh, to support regional and local journalism, to support existing businesses, and to encourage the creation of new businesses. Um, they've also looked at, as, as have parliamentary inquiries, the need for some taxation incentives. There should be investment incentives for people to invest in news businesses. Uh, there should be GST relief. Uh, there's, there's no reason why um, that the charitable state is called deductible gift recipient shouldn't be applied much more broadly uh, to media operations and to startups. Um, the reality is uh, if, if there's a sustainable business model for new um, media operations in this country, it's probably a not-for-profit model. Uh, gone are the days uh, where you make big profits uh, out, of, out of media businesses. A and a, a deductible gift recipient status uh, applied by the government uh, could encourage that. Uh, they could also uh, uh, make it a tax deduction for every individual um, who takes out a subscription to a newspaper or a news website. Uh, you know, there, there are a range of initiatives uh, that have been suggested over and over again, and it's I have to say, incredibly uh, disappointing to, to, to just see them met with continuing silence, uh, by and large, from government. Thanks, Paul. I, um, I would like to... Um, well, I want to just make a couple of comments before I go back to the panel about, about what it is that we can do um, as, a, as a group. Um, firstly, uh, we will circulate the link by email um, tonight and tomorrow uh, for people to go online, get onto the petition, engage with the petition. What would be great is if you could copy the link, circulate it to your mates, put it on your social media, um, put it up on the notice board uh, uh, downtown and make sure that as many people as possible are having their say on this issue. The union needs uh, uh, a strong voice coming from the community 
uh, people like Michelle and I and Warren and Brian need a strong message coming from the community on this issue to put pressure uh, to put pressure on the federal government. If you're in um, if you're in an organisation, if you're in the Labor Party or if you're in the Country Women's Association or if you're in your local Rotary um, or your local union, um, bring the issue up. Make sure that people are starting a drumbeat of talking about this issue, about raising it with their local member of parliament, about bringing it up as a thing that the government knows for country towns is not negotiable. Um, you know, what is the National Party actually for if it's not there to solve this problem? We need to put pressure on, on local National Party MPs. And of course, if your local paper's still open, write to it, contribute to it, uh, and, uh, and make sure you support it. Uh, and for all those local papers that are behind a paywall, you know, everybody's got a responsibility to contribute and to be a subscriber. I just want to come back to the rest of the panel, um, perhaps to Daria first about what, what, what do you think, Daria, should be the features of people campaigning and speaking up and what do you think would work in your community? Well, I come from a rural community. So if I say everybody knows everybody, um, it's very similar to that. So. I think for local communities that are losing their paper, don't be silent. Do not be silent, do not be complacent. Put your hand up, ring up your local paper, talk to your state and federal member. Think about what it, who you know in that paper that you could get a message through. The support is important. As a mayor, I will always make sure, I've heard of papers withdrawing adverts, uh, councils withdrawing adverts to other papers, we would always make sure, and I check just about on a weekly basis to see what we've got in our paper without stepping over the line. But I think for all of us, we need to remind people how important the paper is. Now, Facebook is out there, we can't take it away, but we need to remind everybody the importance of journalism, the importance of telling a story, and the importance of keeping our community, the blood flowing to keep us alive. So keep the, keep the conversations going, don't be quiet. Don't be complacent, you know, make sure that you're a voice. And I think, Tim, when you were naming all those groups in my head, I was tick boxing, yes, I'm a member of that or the husband's a member yep. of that. Wherever you are, talk about it. And talk about that you are online tonight across Australia, connecting with each other, because we're all concerned about what is going to happen in our own backyard. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, no, thank you, Daria. And, and all of those organisations are really important. I've got to say, if you're in the Country Women's Association, take it up with them. When they take an issue up in, in country New South Wales in particular, uh, people really pay attention and they've they have grabbed hold of a couple of really important issues for, for uh, country women and country communities um, and really, really made a significant impact. Michelle, I think a lot of the time that people think that um, that talking to their local MP, ringing their local MP's office doesn't make a difference. Um, I know as a, as a member of the House of Representatives, you've probably got a very different perspective on that. Could you just talk for a minute about the kinds of things that, that, uh, that people in communities should be doing with their local MPs, what's likely to make a difference? And then maybe a couple of final comments from you about, um, about where you think this issue can go from here. Tim, MPs, uh, we are reactive people. Uh, and as Brian and uh, Warren will also tell you, um, we like to think that we are responsive to our community. So even if it's on an issue that we don't think is important to us, if we have people sending us a lot of emails, and in many cases, emails that aren't necessarily standard form emails, but emails that are written from the heart, or if uh, we get calls and in normal circumstances, asking for people to meet with us. And I think as um, restrictions ease off, um, there will be the ability to do that. Or certainly um, I've been offering the ability to have constituent meetings by Zoom. If that's a group of a couple of people seeking a meeting with an MP, I can honestly tell you, if I got two or three of those a week, I would say it is the hottest issue in my electorate right now. If you don't do it, that is, you're just not applying um, the pressure. 
um, th that is needed. Uh, and the thing about uh, especially backbench MPs, ones that, um, you know, if you've got gnats that you don't hear about very much, uh, if they start getting uh, inundated with these issues, and it doesn't take a lot um, to inundate in some cases, then that is exactly the kind of issue they are gonna raise in their party room. They raise that in their party room, then someone else is going to say, I'm having exactly the same issue. So it is, it is actually something that goes viral in MP world, um, especially if you're a marginal seat uh, MP as well. So I cannot understate, uh, yeah, I overstate um, how important that is to have that communication, um, to reach out, to insist on a meeting, insist on a reply, um, to insist on uh, a return phone call. So that's the, the MP lobbying side. Um, the other side is, uh, look, it is, um, it is a travesty uh, that we're in a situation we're in where so much is happening um, and we really fear it is going to be um, too late. But it has been um, pressure by Labor um, on uh, Michael McCormack, on the government that is actually getting those responses. They hate it um, when uh, we actually have a voice on regional uh, uh, news networks, for example. Um, it really gets their goat because, as I'm sure some people in this call will know, uh, some of these MPs, they've been there forever or it's always been a safe seat. And they treat their local news outlets like it's their own fiefdom. You know, so they can't deal um, with any criticism. So reaching out um, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and getting uh, stuff made into you know, some of those experiences into um, local news make a difference as well. Um, but again, I just want to end by saying I think that um, we should all get on board um, the MIA campaign uh, because it really is stating what is the most important thing in all this, and that is the voices of communities. Um, and we should bring that back. Um, it, we should always bring the message back to that. And I think Paul is absolutely right in that summation. Hey, thanks very much for that, Michelle. And thank you for your work on this issue. Paul, did you have any final reflections you wanted to make on the discussion that you've heard tonight? Look, just, you know, uh, the, the figures are extraordinary. 106 titles close in the 10 years up to 2018. In the last five months, 213 closures or contractions. It, it is an absolute crisis and there is no time to waste. And it's important to remember, in addition to that, we've got the possible looming closure of Australian Associated Press at the end of this month. Uh, and uh, at the end of July, there's going to be an announcement of the latest round of redundancies and cuts at the ABC. Um, you know, you put all those things together, communities are really being dudded uh, and it, it, it is beyond time uh, for the government to take notice, uh, to, to take the concerns of communities seriously and take the interests of communities seriously and do something uh, to, uh, to make sure that the news doesn't stop. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I think um, there's a um, there's th we're, we're going to have to close it off in just a moment. And I know there's a couple of people who are online have had their hand up, uh, which is a thing I understand now. You can do on Zoom. You can put your hand up, and uh, and uh, and and you know then uh, then you get uh, get an opportunity to speak. Not everybody's going to get an opportunity to contribute tonight. There's a lot of people with their hand up. Um, I'm very keen though to hear from people on this issue uh, and to be in touch uh, about making sure that we build an effective campaign. There are a couple of contributions on the chat that I think are really worthwhile noting. The one last one I want to want to draw attention to is I think it was Bob or it might have been Sandra or both of them who were saying it's really important, really important that we engage our local sporting organisations in this work as well. Um, that's where the sporting news goes, junior sport, local sport, uh, and uh, it's absolutely critical that those organisations uh, step up uh, and contribute to the campaign. I want to thank all of the people who came on to speak uh, on the panel tonight. Uh, Paul Murphy, the CEO of the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance. Thank you, Paul. Um, I want to thank Michelle Rowland, the Shadow Labor Communications Spokesperson. Thank you, Michelle. 
also want to thank Daria Turley and just say to the group here, I wouldn't normally make this kind of announcement, but Daria Turley, Mayor of Broken Hill, fantastic fighter for her community and leading uh, woman uh, in local government, has a very big birthday on tomorrow. So happy birthday, Daria, and thank you very much in the middle of your holidays. Thank um, you. <laughs> a long, long fought for uh, week off. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming on and taking time out from family to do that. I wanna thank everybody who's contributed tonight. There's a lot of people who have been on the chat. Uh, 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 we're very keen to talk to Mary. Mary, we're gonna call you uh, over the course of the day tomorrow. We wanna hear as much as we can. We want a drumbeat coming out of every regional community, putting pressure on the government to make this a problem that government is determined to solve and to step up and deliver a package that's capable of keeping these really important local papers open. Thank you all so much for taking time out on what otherwise is a pretty frosty Thursday night. So thank you very much.